Good morning. Uh, hi, this is Renee Howerton from UW-STAR. Could you let us know if you can hear us? So today I have the pleasure of being joined by two absolutely wonderful colleagues, Todd Zimmerman from Physics, as well as John Navarre from English and Philosophy. And they're going to be talking to you about um, subtle applications that they have personally participated in. So as we get started, so I wanted to begin by sharing um, a history of Sotol at Stout. So we do go back quite a few years. When I was first introduced to the formal concept of, of Sotol, it was through my predecessor, uh, Dan Reardon, when he was director of NTLC. And he did a version of the program that was very similar to the WTFMS. At Stout, NTLC has been very much engaged in facilitating WTFS throughout the years. Our role continues to grow in everything from uh, announcing new opportunities uh, as fellows and scholars, uh, all the way to forming a subcommittee that evaluates applications we receive, then making a recommendation to the provost, and then uh, finally submitting that to OVID. And so I mention that only because with such active engagement in WTFNS, we have had the, the privilege to learn a great deal about it and then to take that and modify that in, in various programs that we've created so that we could encourage uh, applicants who were not accepted as fellows or scholars to continue their research on our campus. And so what you're seeing here is the Curious Stout Innovators. That was the first. Uh, example of this one of these programs and then that was followed by advancing scholarship of teaching and learning across staff in each case we would have people apply and then we would um, provide them with mentors and they would work on research projects and they would they would basically follow the same path that the traditional WTF and um, recipients or participants had done in addition to that, we apply subtle and stout in our communities of practice. And every one of them has some kind of research component. And I share that because I know that communities of practice are defined differently across the UW system. But here, we basically invite people to participate who have an idea for a project, so they design, implement, and assess a project in the classroom. Again, it is always with that intent to answer that the deeper question of are your students really learning uh, what you intended for them to learn. So as I mentioned, all of our CLPs do have a research component and through the years we have become um, perhaps much more focused on, and not in all cases, but in many cases including the use of IRBs and a more structured research experience. In addition, we have actively and intentionally brought in several speakers. We've hosted workshops. A couple of years ago or so, we brought in uh, LaVon, and she spoke along with Tony Ciccone, and we did a Valentine theme-based uh, workshop on the we also have done numerous presentations because of our communities of practice being so research oriented and because it is, it is part of the subtle research model to in, uh, actively, intentionally um, disseminate your works. So we do uh, support our people in going to presentations. Um, we encourage publications. We've gone so far as to really try to provide them with mentorship and support to actually um, publish a lot of their work. We do also include it in many other facets that we are responsible for, such as the new instructor workshop. Every year we'll bring in former fellows and scholars to talk to our new instructor workshops. We include that during our celebratory events as well. Now what I think is interesting is as I go through all of these bullet points, one of the things that um, was 
re required us to, to step back and really think a great deal about, and that was that we were missing the intentionality. We were missing connecting all the, the dots for, through, through many of these years. So we were doing these SOTL events, but we were not bringing them all together to create a, a larger SOTL statement. And as we have evolved, uh, we've, we have done that, and we're now uh, moving more and more to making sure that our colleagues around us know uh, just how much we value SOTL. And so trying to more effectively connect those dots, and it is our hope that in time to even work with governments to have SOTL um, more widely recognized across this campus and accepted. So we do continue to revise SOTL projects to create new forms and versions of them. And that's why you'll be hearing, from, especially from Todd, one of our newest versions of that. And then you'll get to hear from uh, Joan as well about our, our communities of practice and how they function. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and ask Todd to say. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Todd Zimmerman, and I am a member of the physics department here, and I've been on the advisory board for NTLC for a little over four years now, and a couple years ago I was a WTFNS scholar. So I've really been involved in SOTL here at Stout, um, actually since I started. Um, and what's really shaped my view of SOTL has been um, some of my initial experiences. Uh, when I first got here, I really kind of struck out on my own doing SOTL projects, and I will say that it was not the most productive, um, but I did get in with a group of people that were working on SOTL, a lot of experienced people, and had a really wonderful experience, and that has shaped um, my view of, of SOTL and how to do SOTL. So one of the things I wanted to do was, was to kind of recreate that experience of learning from more experienced uh, faculty members. The other thing that we run into is that um, we get these wonderful people that do SOTL who um, they go off to WTF and S, or they're doing projects here on campus. Um, but as they kind of um, move forward and they become more senior, they go into administrative roles or uh, program director type roles, they kind of cut back on the SOTL. And so um, we have a lot of people here who have done SOTL in the, back, uh, in the past that are no longer uh, working on it. And so we kind of wanted to try to bring some of those people back into the fold. Um, also, we want to grow um, the social experience. I mean, as a teaching, primarily uh, teaching institution, it makes sense to combine our research with our classroom. We don't have the time to have separate research projects that are going on. We really need to uh, have um, some way of multitasking. So um, I worked on this idea with Renee of um, a team approach. And as I mentioned, the idea is to kind of get some of these more experienced people back in and get some new people involved. Um, and one of the reasons that people tend to, to move away from SOTL is, with, with any research, it is a huge time commitment. Um, and so one idea behind these teams is that you're splitting the workload up among several people. So one person is not responsible for the IRB and the writing and the survey and all of the data analysis. Um, also, the hope is by bringing people together, we can kind of form some long-term collaborations. Um, that's really one of the best ways to um, get the word out, is to have teams working together. And also, when you're collecting data from multiple classes, especially if you can go across multiple disciplines, you're going to get data that is much more applicable and much more um, publishable. As we know, with our small class sizes, anytime you're taking data, if you have a small n, it's going to make your statistics very hard. So if you want to go to the next slide. All right. I have to admit, being on Blackboard Collaborate is very disconcerting because I feel like I'm staring at this little shiny ball. And <laughs> at least Renee and Joan are here, but hopefully there's some other people out there actually <laughs> listening. Um, so the idea was we would gather uh, teams of three, not wedded to that number, but it just seemed like a good fit. Um, and my initial idea was to get two experienced SOTLers um, and to try to get people that have slightly different uh, strengths. So looking at people that have strengths in um, research methods and developing tools for measuring things, um, people who have a background in writing um, when it comes to the publication, as well as people that are very comfortable with data analysis because a lot of times it's, it's hard to find one person who's comfortable in all areas. And so finding a team with different areas of uh, specialization I thought would be um, Good. Um, also, by bringing in a new faculty member, you know, they're not 
figuring everything out on their own. For me, that was the most important experience, was working with a group of people that had done this before, that knew all the, the hurdles that you had to face, who knew how to write an IRB, who knew how to analyze the data. Um, that way I wasn't teaching myself everything. Um, and so it kind of lowers the bar uh, to get into a subtle project. And so the idea was that you'd have a common project that all three members would be working on one research topic that they could then measure in each of their classes. Now, as you know, you plan these things and they don't always work out that way. And so uh, one of our teams actually, um, they're working on separate projects, each member that are slightly related. And so we're just kind of learning to kind of roll with things and, and let, the, let the teams uh, evolve the project as they want. Um, the hope here is that we'll ultimately get some publications out of this. Um, that may not happen within the time frame of this project, but again, by bringing these collaborations together, that will hopefully continue to work after the project. Um, the hope is that we can actually gather enough data to have something to publish at some point in time. Um, so this is the first year of that project, and uh, I think it's going well. I'm on one of the teams, and um, we're having some really good experiences. Um, one of the benefits that we've had is the um, NTLC fellow, Joan Navar, who I'm about to introduce. Um, she has a strong background, in, especially in the writing aspect. That's one of the things that our team uh, was definitely not as strong in, and so having this fellow that we can reach out to and having somebody else who will give us um, some, some more feedback has really strengthened us. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Joan now and let her talk about um, being a fellow and uh, communities of practice. Hello, everyone. As Todd said, I'm, I'm a, the Nakatani Fellow this year, and I've had the privilege each month I'm meeting with the SOTL teams. And it's wonderful because, in part, I'm able to hear about their projects, but I'm also able to shepherd them, encourage them, kind of give them, um, well, I'm a cheerleader of sorts. And I enjoy it. And they're doing some amazing work, so I can't wait to see what they create by the end of the year. I'm here today, however, to talk about the community of practice at UW Stout. In particular, I'm going to look at the film and film studies community of practice and look at this as a case study. As Renee noted, the expectations of a community of practice member are that you should meet at least twice a month through both semesters and that you assess your work and students' learning outcomes for the COP and then that you present at our May Day celebration. And we, of course, are encouraged to uh, share our research in other venues or at other venues like ISOLO. And upon completing, we we do get a financial incentive, which is always appreciated. The film and film studies community of practice, um, as you might have seen from the previous slide, went on for a series of years. And it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for interdisciplinary studies and conversation. And what we decided to look at is really, it fit our polytechnic model at UW South. And that was film in terms of pre-production, production, post-production. Post but also, as you'll see in a future slide, we decided to focus on visual literacy. And that's a conversation we're still having. Okay. So we met once a month, but we also decided to, as part of our meeting, it, we were going to make it a much more public meeting. So it was a... Um, educational outreach and giving you some snapshots of what we ended up doing in the first year, 2013-2014. Uh, we showed a film, Wanja, made by a Saudi Arabian female filmmaker. And we had, uh, we absolutely packed one of our biggest rooms and it was very exciting, and we even were able to serve food appropriate to the Saudi culture. So it was a real mixture of um, visual as well as culinary diversity. And afterwards, we had a conversation that was really wide-ranging, as we have a number of um, international students who wanted to participate and did, 
So we had many voices commenting, questioning, connecting. The next year, we continued our exploration of film and getting students to think about film, not so much as consumers, but active participants in film. Here's an example of one of our uh, events. And we continued the exploration of underrepresented filmmakers, in this case, a female filmmaker, a Russian-American artist. And her name is Ala Nazimova. And this was a great opportunity to not only show a silent film, a controversial silent film made by a woman, but also to introduce theory so we had the students thinking about the theory of the female gaze. Can women uh, look and look back? So that was great fun because they could actually apply that theory as a lens to the film. As I noted earlier, a component of all of our community practice is that we disseminate work. And Renee's done a wonderful job of creating the May Day celebration where we get together and we share. And here's a sample of what we presented May 2014. We talked about the power of the visual in the classroom, connecting with students through film and other media. And there is that focus I mentioned earlier, which is visual literacy. 2015-2016 was a very interesting and exciting year because, again, we were able to focus on the interdisciplinary nature of film. And in this case, we looked at a film adaptation. So the whole campus was encouraged to read Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. And then we also had a showing of Truffaut's classic version of 451. This was very exciting because we were able to get a number of campus leaders and professors and students involved in a 451 program. And here's part of our poster and website. And then here's a picture of the program with our multifaceted event programming planning that we had. So the provost was very generous with his time and did, he gave us the kickoff lecture. And again, the room was packed. So here he is addressing the students before we looked at the film adaptation. As part of our programming in the spring to conclude our 451 film um, event, we had uh, Fahrenheit 451, 451 Short Film Festival open to all students on campus. They had uh, to adhere to copyright rules, so it was a good experience with film festivals, uh, royalty-free music, and so on. But this is a program from our 451 event, and we connected this with our Stout Family Weekend. And it's, a, it's always a great opportunity because family members come to campus and enjoy seeing the research that their students have done. And here is a, a picture of, coming up, a picture of, well, this is a snapshot of the fact that this was a jury film festival. And I think the next slide will show you that we actually had some money for students, which was greatly appreciated by the winners. And look at all of our sponsors. It's kind of this wonderful web of people who believed in what we were doing. And to go back to our objectives, the film festival stressed close reading, analysis, collaboration, problem solving, and even the importance of place and storytelling. Part of this uh, program, I also had students in my honors class they, they uh, made the program, so they were able to think about where the film festival should take place on campus. They drew out a map, and then they also had an exhibit in addition to the film festival. 
And here are some photos. The film um, screen is there, but you can see I took this photo before the audience arrived. I regret not taking any photos when it was packed, but I was busy. And then, and then there's a photo of the exhibit on the other side. We're actually going to have the uh, Short Film Festival again this year, so we're continuing this work with having students make short films and share their work. So as a summary, this film and film studies community of practice it offered an opportunity for cross-departmental collaboration and curricular innovation. We had faculty members from across campus, and we were all using film as a teaching tool, and we still do. So in a few moments, we're going to open up for questions. But before we do that, I think it's, it's uh, hopefully it's come across that we are trying to be as true to the subtle research model as, as we can be in the sense that we um, do care about the, the quality of the research we're doing. We do care that we assess to make sure that students are learning uh, what we desire for them to learn and, and that we do uh, our best to disseminate this information as well. Right? Then we'd like to go ahead and see if you have any questions. And just like I said in the announcement, if you don't have questions, we plan to apply you with our own questions. Do you need to? I think they should um, they will say the few questions. I think we only have two participants. We have one of them and Diane and the other. All right, if you're, um, you can go ahead and, and uh, please respond to this, but um, if you don't have any questions, we would really appreciate hearing uh, how SOTO is conducted on your campus. What have you seen? Um, how have you been able to elevate the, um, the viewing of it, the importance associated with it? So if you would please share that with us, we would appreciate it. This is uh, Barbara Beeper says, we have a teaching scholars program similar to your LLC and the WTFNS. It involves eight faculty, academic staff, or an academic year. They develop a teaching learning project as part of the experience. We meet about two times a month to discuss related readings. And Diane Reddy says, how do you engage instructors in total? Take that. I actually had a question for the first, uh, Barbara. Barbara. Hi, Barbara. I'm curious if you wouldn't mind um, typing out what are those readings that you've been doing? What? Just a few titles. I'd love to see what you're reading. And I would add that in one of our versions of a community of practice, it was uh, one of our longest ones that we did. It was the NTLC Teaching Champs. It ran for two years. And of that, we also included readings as well, uh, books and, and different things like that. Uh, hi there, everyone. We had some technical difficulty there for a moment, but we are back now. So to answer, so to answer um, Diane's questions about how do we get faculty involved, instructors involved in this, so we do uh, announce, we, we do a lot with marketing, with promotion of our various communities of practice or some of our other research-oriented uh, projects that we support. So we do actively um, invite applications, and most of our communities of practice run between six to, to eight persons. They can be larger, of course. And of that, many of them uh, are facilitated by myself, who, like Joan, I try to uh, be a, a really dedicated cheerleader and encourage people to attend and, and to do it in, in ways that are conducive to their schedules and that kind of thing. You also heard that we do provide incentives and we provide all of the resources uh, for these experiences as well. Okay. 
And now in addition to that, I do have some communities of practice, though, that are facilitated by faculty members. And what's interesting is that uh, as the years go by, we have looked at different ways to make this workable for our very overworked faculty members. And so uh, we're now even uh, using multiple facilitators for individual communities of practice, but doing everything we can to keep the engagement very, very high. Uh, and, and that is another reason why every time we learn of what needs to be done to support them, whether it is support for learning to, to write for publication or creating opportunities for dissemination or purchasing them desired resources, we certainly do try and do that. Uh, Barbara Beaver has a comment. Barbara, I want to thank you for the detailed response. That looks uh, great. That you, I like that you're taking a theme each year and your focus this year. That, that seems to relate to some of the work, or very much to some of the work being done in our SOTL teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the SOTL team that I'm working with, um, myself and two mathematicians, we're actually looking at a belongingness intervention in um, intro courses to see how it can affect their their sense of belongingness, their sense of math anxiety, and engagement. Thank you, Diane. Yes, and isn't Greg wonderful? Uh, I had the privilege to study with him several times. So thank you very much, Diane, and thank you, Barb. Um, we will um, work with Nick Danger, who's also in the room, to uh, make this available to others who, who did share that they'd like to see this. So thank you very much, and have a great Thanksgiving.